Welcome to the Kingmakers Podcast. Kingmakers is an elite accelerator for business buyers. We help entrepreneurs acquire their ideal business and provide them with the tools to succeed post acquisition. I'm your host, Kylan Ginger. Join us as we explore and unlock the secrets to successful business acquisition, growth, and exiting strategies. Hey guys, so if you're enjoying the podcast and you want to take the next step in your business buying journey, there's a couple different ways that you can do this. First, check out our business buying workshop. The Kingmakers Workshop will give you a backstage pass to a private equity firm that acquires and operates six plus new businesses per year. This is an opportunity for you to peek behind the curtain and understand the entire process of finding, buying, and growing an online business. The workshop is limited to a small amount of serious business buyers, so you can count on it being intimate and you can plan on spending plenty of one on one time with some of the best and brightest entrepreneurs in the MA space. So go to kingmakers.co forward slash workshop. Again, that's kingmakers.co forward slash workshop to get more information and to apply. Second, if you are serious about buying a business, I would love to have a quick chat with you and see how we can help. Go to kingmakers.co forward slash call, tell us a little bit more about yourself, and then you can schedule a free consultation call, and we'll see what we can do. Again, that's kingmakers.co forward slash call. Talk to you soon. Hello, business buyers, and welcome to another Kingmakers episode. Get stoked because today on the show, we have Ken Roberts. Ken is a website investor and entrepreneur that works with the top SEOs in the world to acquire and scale seven-figure online businesses. In the last two years, he has personally acquired five online businesses with successful exits to Wired Investors and Empire Flippers. Supremacy SEO has dubbed him the Leslie Nope of SEO last year, and he was recognized by Google as an all-star partner. So Ken, man, that is the intro I have for you. Um, by the way, I love the Leslie Note reference. That's one of my wife's and my favorite shows. Actually, we were just watching it last night. Um, but uh, yeah, please fill in some of the blanks and tell us a little bit more about your story. Thanks so much for having me on the show, Kyle. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I got started uh, at my first job uh, after college at a marketing agency, and I ended up coming in there as an early employee. They did graphic design and websites and they didn't really do any digital marketing. So I worked my way up there and really headed uh, the digital marketing department. So we were there and growing the business over the course of four years. It went from uh, just a freelance business, uh, basically, to doing over a million dollars in revenue there, servicing all kinds of clients from startups to big corporations, and doing um, everything from SEO to website design and uh, branding. So as I was working at the agency there, that got me a lot of exposure to different websites, but I was getting kind of burned out. You know, it was uh, it was a tough gig and. I started thinking, man, how am I going to escape the nine to five or rather in the agency world, it was like the nine to nine. <laughs> <When you're, Right. laughs> you know, you're never, you're never off when there's clients. So, totally. uh, so I'm sitting there thinking and I, I'm kind of brainstorming with one of my best friends there and we're saying like, man, we're doing all this work for other people's websites. I, why don't we just take these skills and do it for our own websites? And we were kind of start scared to start a business from scratch because we knew there was just a lot of risk in doing that. So we started looking into what are some existing websites that we can buy. And we sort of came up with this plan of we're going to find uh, a website and then we're going to use all our skills and, and knowledge from working with the clients to be able to grow that website. So we started looking around and we started with uh, empireflippers.com. Mm-hmm. And this is, this is sort of like you've heard of them. Yep. And this is sort of like a marketplace for websites. There's a few different ones out there. Um, but we, lo- we looked at this one and we found uh, the perfect site because it was in the graphic design space. It's actually a graphic design blog. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, right. Because that was our experience. And we're thinking, man, we should really uh, 
instead of going into underwater basket weaving or something, we should <laughs> find something that we have experience with uh, so that it'll be easier to come up with a plan and strategy and content for that website. So we end up buying it. It was a little scary because it's like <laughs> there's this point where uh, you've got your feet on the diving board and you're about to jump in mm -hmm. and like hit that button to send the money to buy it. And you don't know if it's going to come back on the other side. <laughs> But, you know, we did it. We took the jump and uh, those worries were uh, unfounded. You know, they they deliver the goods. We got the website. The whole process was super easy and they do things through escrow. So uh, they make sure that you, you actually get access to everything uh, in there. So we get our first site and that was uh, that was pretty exciting. Like we we started growing it. And uh, around that same time, I'm thinking like, man, I, I want to do this again. Uh, I want to do this on on other sites. I'm just getting burned out from from corporate life. And at that time, I just get a random email from uh, this blog, No Hat Digital, that I've been following. And it was an email asking for people to come down to work with them on buying sites and and doing SEO down in this community of entrepreneurs in Mexico. <laughs> and I'm like, man, <laughs> this is perfect timing. Uh, like I just got a sign that <laughs> uh, this is exactly what I was looking to do. So uh, just total luck. Ended up uh, quitting my job right there, giving my two weeks, uh, and literally two weeks later, I'm I'm down in Mexico in this community of entrepreneurs, and I don't speak a word of Spanish. So <laughs> <laughs> I just had this out of body moment. I'm like, what am I doing here? <laughs> Um, but you know, I had faith in it and, uh, it was, it was really cool. You know, we were living in this house with entrepreneurs and, uh, these are some of the top SEO guys in the world. Uh, we're working with Hayden down there, uh, Spencer Hawes from niche pursuits mm -hmm. and later, later on work with Neil Patel too. So these are like the guys that I grew up reading about and never in my, my dreams did I think I'd actually be working with them. So it was just a great experience uh, learning how to buy those websites and scale them. And I brought uh, my experience from the agency to the table, too, with our, our processes for dealing with 1,500 clients on uh, being able to grow those sites, publish content, build links, and, and things like that. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was really cool. We're living, we're living in this house, and we kind of have upstairs is the... Uh, guys that are working on the SEO stuff, the marketing guys with me. Mm -hmm. And downstairs, we kind of have the developers, and they're actually working on a keyword research tool uh, that that uh, they recently purchased. So at, at one point, you know, we're working on this. We're doing sort of acquisitions upstairs. We've got a couple websites. We're doing SEO courses and, and things like that, internships. And downstairs, they've got the... Uh, They've got the keyword research <laughs> software, and we at one point we just think like, man, we should just combine these two because uh, they need us, we need them. Let's let's combine it, and that's sort of how uh, Wired Investors got started, and uh, they acquired our our SEO training company, put them together, got the whole team and the processes and things, and we started uh, really ramping up to buy more websites. And over the last two years, we ended up buying uh, 20 different website properties. It was a combination of content websites, which you might call a blog or a informational website, and software businesses, uh, which some people would refer to as SaaS, S-A-A-S, software as a service businesses. So we, we go ahead and start building that portfolio. And on the side, I'm also working on building my portfolio. This is where I am today is I own four different websites personally. Uh, and in, uh, in combination with some of these other properties I've been helping grow, uh, that's really my focus today. Well, I love it, man. I appreciate you giving us all the background, especially on Wired Investors there, um, which is you know something new I hadn't really heard of really the the absolute genesis of that whole um <laughs> endeavor so that's that was great and for people listening you know i think 
a lot of the guests that we may have on, and if you've listened to Hayden and Devin's episode, which is episode one, uh, you've probably heard about Mexico, specifically Valle de Bravo, Mexico, and this community of online art entrepreneurs and business buyers that uh, meet down there. Um, it, it is a really, really neat thing that, that we have going on there. In fact, I'm headed down there just next week, and there's a few of us meeting for uh, all week down there in Valle de Bravo, Mexico, um, just not to work on some businesses. And that's, you know, here at Kingmakers, that's something that we really focus on is not just teaching people how to buy and, and optimize an online business and, and exit it uh, successfully, but also to build a community of like-minded individuals and entrepreneurs and business buyers. And uh, it's, it's tough to build a community if you can't see each other face-to-face and hang out and, you know, have a beer together um, play some ping pong or, you know, table tennis or, or whatever. And so th- that's what we go down to, to Mexico to do. And so, um, yeah, just, just wanted to highlight that, but, um, yeah, man, I, I would love, you know, I, I think the majority of our listeners are either a, they're interested in buying an online business, um, probably for the first time, uh, or B, they already own an online business and they're interested in optimizing it, uh, operating it, better. Um, so I would love to sort of split this episode into a couple different segments, um, roughly. And so the first question I'd have for you is it'd be interesting to get your take on is why would somebody want to buy an online business and what, what has you particularly excited about this kind of asset? You know, why are you building a portfolio of, of, of this type of asset? I'm extremely excited about online businesses because they can be managed from anywhere in the world. We were just talking about Mexico. I've been traveling quite a bit too. So it's a business where you don't actually have to physically be there, which is is really nice. And even if you're not bit by the travel bug, then if, if you have kids or a puppy at home or whatever <laughs> that is, you can actually be there and manage your business without actually being there inside your business. That's really nice. Uh, and I, I've just kind of found that I save so much time not worrying about commuting to work and all those those sort of little things that are are not fun about the the nine to five. So that's extremely exciting to me. The other thing about it is it's somewhat passive. So uh, it's not 100 percent passive in that it's like a stock <laughs> where you you don't have to look at it. But uh, you do you do have to put some work in. But the point is, if, if you sort of put that work in the beginning, you can benefit from those rewards later on. And if you can automate some of those processes or bring in a manager, you can really reduce the time that it takes to manage that online business. So that that's actually an interesting point I'd like to highlight on. I mean, it seems like a silly question, but <laughs> there's there's a lot of propaganda out there that it really it was it was great books like the four hour work week that that got stuff like this started right this idea of and i say great book because it, it really is but it did sort of launch this uh tidal wave of uh fake gurus and informational products and all these things that promised to make you you know a million dollars a second as you're sitting on a hammock uh lounging on a hammock you know on a, on a beach and so I just wonder now that you've been in the game for a while, and, and I think when people think about owning an online business, they may think of it as they may associate it with that, like it's this basically uh, like yeah p- passive income. Um, and so, how, in your opinion, how realistic is that? And you know, is there ever a point that you you can get to where it is so highly automated and, and systematized? Um, that you really can just make cash while you sleep. Um, and I, I guess what is, what is the process there to get to that point or any, any thoughts that you have around that would be just interesting for people listening who don't have any experience. Of course. So anybody that's telling you it's going to be hundred percent passive and make a million dollars tomorrow is not telling the truth. <laughs> so you want to sort of avoid those deals. Like if it sounds too good to be true, it's not. Um, but you can get it to the point where uh, it, it's pretty hands off. Like one of my businesses uh, is uh, something where I, I usually spend maybe four hours a month on it. Uh, and I'm just sending invoices basically for that business, checking on sales. So um, 
it's not the larger the business is, the more time it's probably going to require. That's a very small business. So it's something that I can sort of be comfortable leaving alone uh, at the same time. And if you can get multiple of those, those smaller sort of automated businesses, um, then it's, it can be pretty passive, but the, the more you grow, um, and the larger that business is, like if you're looking to completely replace your income, then it's going to require more work and, uh, more time up front to, to be able to do that. Now, another interesting point kind of along those lines is, I guess, what is the real difference in terms of effort, in a smaller business versus a larger business and also in terms of acquiring it in your experience. Um, because you know, I would think, I guess what's interesting is people tend to associate, Oh, it's, it's a much larger business. So they're doing, you know, 500,000 or a million, a bit the, you know, per year. Um, this thing is going to take a lot of work to acquire and to run versus maybe one that's only doing, you know, 30 K profit a month or, or something. Is that true or, or do you sort of notice that regardless of you know, how many zeros are at the end of <laughs> numbers, it, it could be more or less the same amount of work? It just depends on more the, the niche and where the business is and, and kind of its uh, growth cycle, I guess. It's funny. I kind of find that there's a couple different zones of those businesses. Like one zone would be the business that's sort of under 100k acquisition and i find those ones can actually be pretty passive uh because you can set up systems there but you can't fall asleep at the wheel like it maybe it can be passive for a year but then you're gonna have to come back and put like a substantial reinvestment into content or something else there because if you fall asleep at the wheel uh your competitors are gonna catch up with you you can't just leave it alone forever and ignore it so you do need to kind of come back periodically and revisit that business. Uh, and then there's like sort of another zone of 100K to uh, 500K businesses where that zone I find is particularly tricky because there's uh, sometimes that is actually a full time job for somebody and they haven't automated much. It's not really enough to hire a big team or a full time manager. Um, so actually I would even say that zone's more like 50 K to, uh, maybe 200 K it's, it's basically somebody's salary in there and that's like the owner operator. So it's sort of hard to replace them. They might be doing all the tasks themselves and it's going to be a lot of work for you to be able to automate yourself out of that business. It can still be done, but it's sort of a tricky zone. It's, it's almost like you're buying a job at that point. And then, uh, above that, you know, you're looking at maybe the 200 K's, uh, um, a million and million plus in earnings. That's the size where now you can start hiring on the lower end an assistant on the higher end. Maybe you've even got a full-time manager and a whole team behind it so that you can kind of step back from that business. And uh, that's just kind of a big mistake that I sometimes see is you don't want to get into a business and just buy yourself a job. Uh, you want to sort of stay, at least my philosophy is on the lower end uh, and do a big volume of businesses that you can automate or on the higher end and get something where you've got uh, a manager and a couple of employees that can be able to uh, do some of that work for you. Okay, so so question, in your experience acquiring businesses for, for yourself and then the acquisitions that you were involved in with Wired Investors, how many of the sellers or founders had that you bought from had highly systematized their business, I guess. Was that pretty common? Or when you guys stepped in, did you see, were you always seeing a lot of room for, for improvement there? Yeah, we always saw a lot of room for improvement. Not a lot of them were systematized, but I think part of that was just self-selection bias in there. We were looking for businesses that were not um, super, uh, super automated yet because there was some opportunity for us to come in there and do that. Uh, and and replace some of that work. But at the same time, we didn't want to come in and find something that was such a mess that it couldn't be uh, automated or we couldn't sort of run that with a minimal team on there. Right. Makes sense. So, so people listening might think that there are high barriers to buying an online business, and so they may not take action out of fear or maybe just feeling overwhelmed. Um, it'd be interesting to hear you speak to some of those perceived barriers that you've seen and, and maybe why they're not as formidable as they may seem? 
Definitely. As far as barriers go, I think the initial buying and finding of a website is the first step that you have to take. Yep. And there's there's a lot of sources out there to, to help buy websites. Uh, so it's a lot better than it was maybe 10 years ago where there wasn't a lot of deals uh, out there. So that's the first step is like finding a good website. Um, and the second step there would be actually performing the due diligence on the website. So this is something where honestly, I would recommend uh, starting off small, like your first acquisition is a smaller site so that you can kind of learn that due diligence process, make some mistakes, but there's not a lot of money at risk because of that, or partner with somebody experienced that's going to help you uh, through that process with the diligence and going to help run the business so that you can kind of learn from them. And Mm -hmm. that was my process as well. Yeah. So it sounds like you've done basically both of those, um, <laughs> which <laughs> it, yeah, it, that seems like, I, I think that's some really good advice. And so if you are listening and you're wanting to get into this space and I would say you're, you're correct. Like those are probably two of the biggest barriers. Like you want to, it's scary, right? You want to make sure that you're buying the right site, but you know, how do you know where to find that? And then how, once you have found something that eh, this is, you know, piques my interest, how do I know, that it's low risk and high opportunity, right? So um, I think that the, A, finding something that's small enough to where if worst case scenario, you could afford to lose it. I mean, that's always a good uh, first tenant of investing in anything, only invest what you can afford to lose, right? Uh, or secondly, partner with somebody, um, which is, and I'm plugging a little bit here, but basically why why Kingmakers exists um, because that, that is what we do, deal flow and, and diligence. And I think what really sets us apart too from sites like say Empire Flippers is we're able to really find these these passive sellers out there. Um, we have our systems and processes down so well that we can reach out to thousands of potential sellers that may have not been thinking about selling, but once we you know put forward a, a proposition, um, th- they may. And so these are kind of off-market deals that, that we're able to find um, and so that's kind of the, I guess where we can help with the second option there is, is partnering with somebody. Um, but it'd be interesting to hear you talk though, just give kind of a, I, I know due diligence is a very detailed, uh, subject that we could spend like a few hours on probably, <laughs> but it'd be interesting to hear from your point of view, maybe a broad overview on when you do find a site that looks interesting, what are some of the main things that you're looking for? Like, let's say you can are just perusing through uh, empire flippers and you're looking at these sites. Like what, what are some of your main concerns? What are some of the main red flags that you look for? Um, and of course we know we can go infinitely down this rabbit hole and you can get very, very detailed. Um, but just initially, what are some of those things that you look for that might be helpful for people to understand who are listening? Sure. So there's a lot behind due diligence. I've looked through hundreds of businesses over the course of the last few years, and there's probably like five main factors to take a look at. Uh, First, I would look at, uh, and these are pretty simple things, like you don't need to be super technical to, to find these, but is the business actually increasing month over month and year over year? And sometimes you get into these situations where, oh, I think I can turn it around. And more than likely, it's hard to buck that trend. Uh, you know, you're fighting, fighting an uphill battle for a business that's going downhill. So just finding something that's steady or that's increasing is just going to help yourself out a lot. So uh, looking for that first. Second is what kind of business model is it? Is it a content publishing site where uh, its main source of revenue is going to be advertising, you're publishing articles, or is it going to be like a software business where it's very technical and you need some experience to run that, or you have to hire a developer to run that. So you can save yourself a lot of trouble just by picking the right type of site uh, model there. And uh, if if you are a developer, content site might actually be bad for you because you've got the experience, uh, technical experience to background to uh, manage something that is uh, a software business. So kind of think about what type of site you can buy there. And other important factors, um, 
did they do anything sketchy with the backlinking on the website? So uh, backlink is essentially somebody has linked their website back to you. Uh, and there's a couple sort of tricksters out there that will do things called uh, private blog networks where they'll just spin up a bunch of websites, link them all back to their website that they're trying to sell or they buy links from other people. So you want to make sure that not only do you ask the seller, are you running a PBN uh, or are you buying links or renting links, but check yourself or have a third party check for that uh, because Eventually, Google's going to find out what they're doing. It's actually against Google's policy to do PBNs or backlinking schemes there. So you want to make sure that uh, the links are natural uh, or they're doing white hat outreach on that site and um, that Google's not going to find out a couple months after you buy the website and take it off of the index. You don't want to lose your traffic there. So that's really important to check. Uh, yeah, and actually speaking of backlinks, I guess to go a little bit more in depth there, um, like why does that matter with Google? Like why would a site want to have backlinks? So a backlink is essentially acting like a vote in Google. Google's looking at your website, and if you have pretty good content already, uh, content meaning a blog post or an article that helps answer the person's question uh, that they're searching for, then they're going to say, okay, if your content's on par with everybody else, what are the other factors that are sort of going to distinguish you? Do other websites trust you? Do other people trust you? And um, it's not just about the number of backlinks, but the quality of backlinks. So I, I said that it was like a vote, but not all votes are equal in Google. A vote coming from a high authority website, something that is well known, is going to be worth a lot more uh, in Google's eyes, then uh, uh, link back from some random mom and pop blog. So right. you have to keep that in mind. So it's kind of like I I did Amazon FBA for a while, and for for a while there were several different tools that you could use to when you would post your product for the first time up on Amazon. You could basically generate positive reviews, like hundreds of them, which <laughs> ranks it in in the basically the search results when somebody's looking for that particular product. And they, you know, eventually really cracked down on that because most of the reviews were disingenuous, you know, to to, to, to say the <laughs> least. And so it's it's kind of like that. Then basically, is what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. At least that's what you want to watch out for. Um, <clears throat> Neat. I guess continuing along this train of, of conversation here, what are some of the things that somebody could do to grow an online business post acquisition that maybe the previous founder typically hasn't done before? And, and like, you know, you can use your own experience after you acquired your own sites. What are some of the things that you did to sort of, I guess, take it to the next level and, and get your ROI? So first thing that I like to do after acquiring a site is change the monetization, meaning the way that people are actually paying you or how you're earning revenue on the website. So if we think of this sort of like a ladder with rungs, the first rung, the first step on the ladder would be maybe like Google AdSense. So it's super easy to set up. You just paste some code on there and then people are, are viewing the ad and clicking on the ad that gives you give you revenue to the site. But because that's easy, you're not going to get a lot of revenue. Google's kind of the middleman there taking the majority of the profits. Uh, so you want to kind of think about like, how can I climb that ladder uh, to a higher level? So maybe instead of Google AdSense, you've got a different ad network on there that's paying a little bit more. There may be a specialty ad network. Uh, let's take another step up. Maybe you're selling your own ads in that spot directly to advertisers, so you've cut out the middleman. Now let's take one more step up. Instead of just advertising, perhaps you have your own product now, and you're you're actually uh, selling your product. There is no advertisers that are taking margin in between there. There's no ad network, and you're actually owning the customers yourself. So that an example of that would be maybe an info product like a course or an ebook, uh, or even a physical product. You mentioned Amazon FBA. You could be selling uh, your own product, and Amazon will do all the heavy lifting of fulfillment and customer returns and things on there. So you, you kind of want to think about it. How can I climb that ladder? 
uh, to get up to the top. And if you can buy a site that's sort of not monetized well, and you can come in and bring a better level of monetization there, uh, then that's a huge opportunity for sites. So I'd really like to look for those monetization wins. And I actually left out a huge one there, which was affiliates. So I do a lot of yeah. affiliate stuff uh, as well. And sometimes you can replace those ads with affiliate uh, banners and links in the content. As yeah. Well. Yeah. I was going to bring that up as well. Cause I know that's one of the things we look for. I mean, this is the type of thing that you can look th- for in the due diligence process. It's pretty easy to understand how they're monetizing, especially if you get some of sort of the pre LOI um, due diligence materials from the potential seller, like their uh, P and L's and maybe they answer a Q and a uh, access to their Google analytics. And one of the easy wins I know we look for is just renegotiating whatever commission rate that you have with a particular partnership or, or an affiliate, you know, already existing on the site. A lot of times you can see an immediate, you know, significant percentage jump in, in revenue post acquisition, just from renegotiating that. And, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing how many sellers have not already tried that. And so it's, it's another one of those easy wins, I guess you could say. That's a great opportunity. I'm glad you mentioned it because, uh, a lot of people are scared to do that. You know, what if they say no? So what if they say no? And more than likely, they're uh, it's almost like a bear. They're more scared <laughs> of you than you're scared of them uh, because you're the one that's actually generating sales for them, right? And um, a good thing to, to say during that conversation too is, is back it up with numbers. Like if your traffic's grown and you've been earning the same commission from this affiliate or same advertising contract, but your traffic's going up, your website's like more valuable to them, but they're they're just paying you the same amount. So they should be happy to pay you more because you're sending them more traffic, getting them more sales. And just people don't think to ask about that or they're scared. Totally. And something else that I've personally done before, and you can like, it's really easy to be dishonest here too <laughs> with, with what I, I'm about to say, but there's a way not to be. Basically, I'll go out and I'll start uh, conversations with different advertisers or different, you know, affiliate partnerships and start to negotiate to that rate that you want. And then you can use that to come back and leverage into the rate that you want with, you know, your current partnership, if that's something that you're more keen to, to keep around. But that's, that's worked for me a lot too in the past. That's a great technique as well. Yeah. Um, so SEO, uh, we mentioned it a few times in your bio. You're obviously the expert here. Um, but SEO, I feel like is that is the big mystery. I feel like to a lot of people, like including myself, I definitely don't know as much about it as I would like. And so it'd be interesting to hear you, uh, give us kind of an overview on what search engine optimization is and why it's important. And maybe some of the sort of key factors, um, to, to look for in a site or to work on, on a site to, to continue to optimize that. But let's let's sort of demystify that a little bit for our listeners. Sure. So I'll start off really easy and then we'll get super nerdy. Sound good? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so search engine optimization is basically the process of getting your articles and your blog posts and pages on your website in front of people on Google. So you want to get them as high as possible and have the most views on Google. And why Google? Because they're the number one search engine. They drive more traffic than Facebook or Twitter or any of these other websites out there. And the difference is it's usually buyer intent traffic too. Like when somebody's searching for something on Google, they want to solve a problem, they want to find a product, or they want to buy something. So it's a, it's much different than somebody that's on Facebook liking pictures of dogs and uh, talking to their friends. Right. So Google is super important for SEO, but like what is behind SEO? There are hundreds of factors, but really it comes down to three things. One is technical SEO. So is your website set up in a way that's going to be easy to use, fast and friendly? Two is going to be the actual content on the website. So the articles on the website are they answering the question that the user has? And is it the best content out there? We can talk about some ways to create the best content out there later on. And three, are 
their links going back to the website and articles? Do other people validate that? Do they think it's the best content as well? Or is it just you that thinks it's the best content? (laughs) So if you do those three things, then you can rank well in Google. There's uh, a lot of sort of factors behind them of what's a good link, what's a good piece of content. But, uh, you know, in general, that it just boils down to those three things. Gotcha. I mean, what I think is interesting about that is, I mean, it, it's, it really holds true for any business, right? I mean, my the majority of my experience so far is in offline businesses, in brick and mortar retail. Um, it, when you move into online business, too, it just seems to get infinitely more complex and, I guess, nerdy and all these different terms and abbreviations that are difficult to understand and uh, search engine algorithms that you have to crack and figure out and adhere to. But what's interesting is if you just come at all of this from a framework of providing value to people, you can solve most challenges pretty quickly. Um, like at the end of the day, that's what every business needs to do to be successful. That's what Google's trying to do. And because that's what Google's trying to do for their customers, that's what every website that uses or, or accepts traffic from Google has to do. Um, and so I just wanted to sort of highlight that, I guess, is in the midst of all this, if you're approaching it always from the standpoint and this framework of providing value to people, um, you'll find your answer a, a lot quicker. I mean, if you just understand, like you said, Ken, people are searching Google to be able to solve a problem. What is that problem that you solve and how can you make that as easy as possible for fee- people to discover and, and to solve for people on your on your website? Um, but no, that, that was a good overview. Did we get to the, the nerdy part yet or no? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the more nerdy part is um, if we go and this will get us into Crow, CRO a little bit too, conversion rate optimization. But the nerdy part is, you know, go back to your fifth grade science class and think about the scientific process. We start with a problem and then we come up with a hypothesis of this is why how I think I can solve that problem. And then we end up moving into testing that. So we'll design a test and then we'll come back and look at the results of that test and say, did this validate or invalidate? that hypothesis. And this is true of both SEO and CRO of of doing tests with articles, testing our click-through rates on our headlines and things like that. And that gets a little bit more nerdy because we're looking at the statistics and saying, uh, you know, did this article actually beat this other article? So we can test and find out uh, what content is best instead of just guessing and saying, okay, I think this is the best article. Yep. That that makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess another question I would have is what are some of the mistakes that you see being made the most when it comes to, let's say, both of those things, uh, search engine optimization and and conversion rate optimization? So in both of them, I would say you have to test everything yourself on that because websites are different. There's a couple of rule of thumbs, like this is going to work in general for most people. But I've, I've seen cases where the rule of thumb was tested. And for that particular audience, like they needed more information. Like, you know, everybody says, put your call to action above the fold on the website. So it's fast to click on them. We actually did a test on one website where um, it was worse putting that above the fold uh, on the site. It was actually better. Yeah, we actually increased the clicks by moving it further down the page. Because for that particular product, people needed more information to learn about what the product was before they Mm, bought it. That's interesting. Um, It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't like a fast buy, something that you could just compare options really quick. They needed to actually learn the whole process of how to buy that product. Yeah. And and again, for people listening, I, we, we just, we have an experience level that really ranges, but above the fold, I, at least in, in my words would, would mean on any given screen, people are viewing it. It's like, as soon as they hit that page or that website, they they see it versus they might have to scroll down a little bit. That would be considered below the fold. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, that, that's really interesting. And so um, maybe like I know like A-B split testing is kind of in that. Do you want to explain that that really quick is it's just sort of the, this mechanism for testing a, a few different options? 
Sure. And the way A-B split testing works is I'm going to put uh, one result out there. So maybe this is uh, a headline that I I've written for a page. And then uh, that's going to be test A. Test B, and that's my control. So this is what's already on the website. Test B is maybe going to be something like a different headline, like I'm going to tweak that headline. Or another example would be uh, test A is going to be my button above the fold. Test B is going to be my button below the fold uh, on the site. So I've just moved the position of the button to see if it gets more clicks. And what we're going to do is run those tests with uh, half the traffic going to one page, half the traffic going to the other page, and we're going to see uh, what the results are on that page. And this is uh, one of the cool things when you apply this to uh, SEO, I'm talking more about CRO, but um, when you apply that and you have a big portfolio of sites to test things on, that uh, helps the results become more clear and statistically relevant. You want to be skeptical of anybody that just says, ah, make all your buttons green or um, you know, do uh, put this thing in your title on every site because uh, it's not going to work for uh, some sites, you're going to find uh, that guru sort of advice. Uh, the stuff that really works is, is you're going to go test that yourself, and uh, it's going to be different for various keywords and search intent because no website is going to be the same. Yeah, that's that's actually a good point. Is it doesn't seem like there's a lot of instances where one size fits all. And I just I like your comment on the going back to um, fifth grade science class. <laughs> You, you got to just test. And so um, the only way to do that is to throw multiple op options out there and record the data, uh, analyze the data, and um, you know, don't just make wild guesses, basically. Um, yeah. No, so, I Colin, I want to ask you, <laughs> what were it. you doing in what, – what were you in fifth grade? Were you like a punk rocker or – <laughs> something else i uh, i mean well you nailed it on the head as far as like the phases i went through like punk rock is my favorite music i went through like a goth stage and all that <laughs> all that stuff but no i was homeschooled uh the majority of i mean all through those grades at least and only went to an actual high school for my sophomore mm -hmm. and senior year so um yeah fifth grade i was basically teaching myself and sort of unschooling, if you're familiar with the term, and running around in the woods, um, pr pretty much pursuing any of my natural curiosities. <laughs> what about yourself? Uh, I guess I was sort of the classic rocker guy. <laughs> I had long hair and uh, was like the guy wearing the Led Zeppelin shirt. <laughs> yes. All right. I like it. You and I, <laughs> you and I would, would get along. No, um, I'm actually still in a band, um, and we just this last weekend just recorded another album, and so it's it's sort of more of a more funk rock, a little bit of like hard rock in there. But music is life; it'll it'll never quite <laughs> be done for me. So oh, that's awesome. It's great, man. Well, cool. I, I guess before I let you go, um, just would ask for any final words of advice that you would give to anybody listening who's thinking about buying an online business, but they haven't quite made that step yet. What, what advice would you leave them with? Yeah. So for anybody that's looking to buy a business, I just want to reiterate that you should either start small or partner with somebody on that business and uh, just go ahead, take that plunge, jump off the, the diving board, because that's how you're going to learn is by testing these things out and uh, taking that chance. Uh, I know that you had a few resources that you wanted to share in regards to the things uh, you talked about and, and also for people listening, uh, if you're driving or doing laundry or, or something, we'll have these resources linked in our show notes as well. But Ken, why don't you go ahead and, and maybe share some of these resources and tools that can uh, help people out in the areas we've talked about. Definitely. So for due diligence, I like to use Ahrefs and this is going to help you check backlinks and keywords at the website is ranking for. Um, for anybody that owns a website already, I would recommend installing Thrive Headline Optimizer because we were talking about how can we test those headlines out and see which ones might rank better in Google and get better click-through rates. So Thrive Headline Optimizer is, is great for that. And using that in a combination with uh, Google Search Console, which is, which is free, you should sign up for that anyway to really nail those technical elements of SEO. They make it super easy to let you know which pages have errors and things 
on there. Uh, and then finally, just for optimizing that content, I mentioned that Google wants to show the best content to people. And that means you have to cover the subject comprehensively. I like to use Market Muse for that optimization because they're going to give me ideas of what to talk about in that article so that I can put my best foot forward in Google. Fantastic. Thanks for that, man. Well, folks, you are the average of the five people you hang around the most. And today you've been hanging out with Kylan and Ken, learning how to build your business empire. For more information or to get in touch, head over to kingmakers.co and always remember to build beyond business. Hey, business buyers, if you loved what you heard today and you feel like we've earned it, subscribe to the podcast and head over to iTunes to leave us a five-star rating and review. This helps us out a ton and we love to read your comments. Thanks so much.